I was going to wake up Monday after I got married, I got married on a Friday, it was going to be a black cloud over my head, but sure, it was OK. I'm, I'm enjoying it. But uh, between you and me, you know, I haven't changed at all. <laughs> On August 20th, 1979, rock star Rod Stewart and his wife Alana welcomed a baby girl, Alana Kimberly Stewart. Rod was there at the birth. They gave him this hairnet things to put on his head, the cap things, and he had on these leopard skin boots. So with the <laughs> in the delivery room with the green with a green paper outfit. And he loved it. He was a great dad and he he loved being with Kimberly. But the rocker also had other commitments. Kimberly was born, you know, when Rod Stewart was, you know, already at the sort of peak of superstardom. Rod's single, Do You Think I'm Sexy, was selling a quarter of a million records a week and topping charts in 11 countries. That was the point in his career where he needed to be on the road a lot. When Kimberly was three months old, Alana became pregnant again. I thought you couldn't get pregnant when you were breastfeeding, but I was wrong. <laughs> On September 1st, 1980, the 34-year-old gave birth to a boy, Sean Stewart, with her six-year-old son, Ashley, from her first marriage, plus two toddlers, Alana had her hands full. I was trying to keep up with Rod and his life and being on tour and traveling, and it was a pretty stressful time. She doesn't let me get away with a great deal. She's a great mother. That's about it. I mean, she's everything I've always wanted. She doesn't like football, and she's not too keen on rock and roll, which is a bit of a sore point, but uh, we're working on that one. I really pushed myself, and I was kind of dragging some of the time, and then I was diagnosed with Epstein-Barr. Epstein-Barr is a viral infection that causes chronic fatigue. While Alana struggled, Rod toured. Kimberly found it difficult to cope with Alana's illness. She tried to be as present as she could, but she couldn't come jump on our trampoline or anything. You know, she had to rest. It was very hard for us because, you know, when my dad was out of town, we wanted her to play with us, like how daddy plays with us. I don't take the kids on tour with me, simply because I find it difficult to get myself out of bed in the morning from one gig to another. And with kids, it would be impossible. I don't think it would be fair on them. And it was unfortunate that his career was one that kept him away from home a lot. Kimberly never liked him leaving. I mean, neither one of them did. They were always much happier when he was home. But Kimberly was such a little drama queen. I mean, we used to call her Betty Davis. I would just cling onto his leg, and I'd be like, no, Daddy, I had a dream that your plane's going to crash. You can't go. He's like, Kim, you used that excuse last time. I'm like, well, I know something bad's going to happen. You just can't go. And I just like hold onto his leg, like for dear life, just not letting him go. I think not having any parent in the home has to have some effect, but, you know, you try and make up for it. He was, like, a very unusual father. He kind of put us to sleep in an odd way. He would have this long, like, broomstick, and he would scratch my brother's back, and then he would do mine at the same time, because our beds were right next to each other, and we both complained. So I always remember him doing that to put us to sleep, and he would sing to us. On the rare occasions Rod took his family with him, Kimberly saw firsthand that he was no ordinary dad. I used to sit on the side of the stage and I'd look out in the audience and you'd see, you know, hundreds and thousands of people just like singing every song and just like tears in their eyes and joy and just like such happiness to be there. It's like a little confusing being little and like, wait, that's my dad. Like, they can't have my dad. Stuart was hard to hold even for Alana. In 1983, they decided to separate. One of the things that I think eventually became a real wedge between us was he really wanted to move back to England, or at least have a home there and spend a lot of time there. And, you know, I was just a real American girl, and I wanted California to be my home, you know, my home base. Meanwhile, her 38-year-old husband hooked up with another beautiful blonde, 23-year-old model Kelly Emberg. Rod and Kelly quickly set up house. His kids, Kimberly and Sean, stayed with Alana. Clearly, that that kind of iced the proverbial cake because their mother was struggling. And then to have this new outside influence, um, Kelly uh, was very decent to, the, to Kimberly and to, to Sean. 
but it didn't make it any easier. I really appreciated that there was someone in his life who really liked my kids, you know, and who genuinely cared about them. On February 1st, 1984, Alana filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. And you get married and you think you'll never get divorced and it's the last thing you think you're gonna go through and that your kids are gonna have to go through and, and then, you know, somehow it happens. Kimberly was four years old at the time. I think my first memory of the divorce was she was in bed and I was begging her to come watch me swim and she was just so upset and, and I just said, I'm like, Mom, I just want to stay with you. And so I just would lay in bed with her. I'd put them to bed at night. They would cry and want to know where their daddy was and when he was coming home. Daddy was living in a house up the street <laughs> and he would come pick me up and he wouldn't come in. Then, I, you know, I knew that there was something going on. Kimberly didn't have time to feel sorry for herself. In 1985, she began attending the exclusive Buckley School in Sherman Oaks, California. You know, you had Nicole Ritchie, you had Paris Hilton. You, they pretty much all had a parent or parents that were very successful. Kimberly really played down a lot of who her father was. Kimberly, I think it has that kind of persona where she doesn't trust anybody, like even at, you know, nine or 10, she's always been really like self-reliant. I wasn't one of those extremely social kind of people. I was very, very like painfully shy. And I didn't make friends easily because I was so self-conscious of like what they might think. But Rod didn't care. He turned up to school functions in a Lamborghini and leopard pants. <laughs> Oh my God, I was so embarrassed. Especially the Lamborghini, because it wasn't just bright red in a Lamborghini, it was the sound of the engine. I mean, I knew, you know, when my dad was coming, like five minutes before he came into the school. And of course, all my teachers and everything, the women teachers were like getting their hair ready and everything. Cause like, you know, they all loved him and he was so charming and, you know, got great grades. <laughs> In 1987, Kimberly's universe expanded. Rod's girlfriend, Kelly Emberg, delivered a baby girl, Ruby Stewart. Even an adorable little sister couldn't make up for her dad's absence. When I started going over to my friends' houses and I saw that their dads got to come home at five and help them with their homework and sit down for dinner like every single night, and it was consistent, it was hard for me to go back to my house and not have him there. I was also extremely ashamed because I felt like everyone judged me. I've always said to be born into this kind of life as I was, as Kimberly was, there's always a penalty to the privilege, whether it be emotional or, or socially in the world, how you're treated. There's always a little, you know, nick in the armor. I really wanted to be normal, like more than anything. I just wanted my family to be normal and to be together and to be whole. And I, I wanted that so bad, and that's not how it was. Coming up, little Kim grows up. My dad was so chill about it. He it would always be like, what, you got shagging? You enjoying your monster?